All right, season finale. You guys ready? Yeah! <laughs> I'm Vince. I'm Ryan. I'm Matt. I'm Lana. I'm Aaron. I'm Jonathan. I'm Andrea. I'm Daniel. I'm Aaron. I'm James. Okay, everyone, we don't need to know your names. Let's just get this going. Yeah. Okay. Why did they yeah, not? there you go. Right, what is this? Um, okay, so it's one of our most famous. Did you forget to write? No, no, I'm sure I remember it. it Please I, enjoy it. Uh, no, I'm sure. Did you forget to write? What? I can't remember. I'm sure I said it. I took the day off. Yeah, well, I came here for Cora. Well, I'm gonna be late for work today. I'll figure this out. Okay, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. You like Avatar? Welcome to Carly Cast, episode one. So yeah, Ryan's still trying to figure out how to get Cora recorded, so let's just take a look at last week's viewer response. If the theory of Iroh being both Zuko's daughter and Bumi's son is true, then it'd be like if Zuko and Aang had a kid. Zuko plus Aang equals Iroh. That is one hot baby. I approve. I have a really crazy theory. Iroh is Mako's dad. I know it is an insanely ludicrous theory, but come on, I think it is possible. The reason why is when I first looked at Iroh I thought, Mako? And then it hit me. Either the creators are trolling us, or there is a serious resemblance between the two. I think that Iroh is going to become sort of a link to the past. If he does in fact join Team Avatar, and he is related to Zuko, I think he'll be able to give Korra and the rest of the team a better idea of the way Avatar Aang and Zuko work together to form Republic City. Iroh 2 would definitely play the more traditionalist firebender, depending on how this war plays out. I believe that he will be more of a cameo character, possibly coming back towards the end of the entire series, to help gather forces against who knows what. Uh, oh, oh, okay, wait, I think I got it. Yeah, Cora, yeah, here we go. Oh. Alright, guys. Alright, guys. Fire. Let's Cora. Yeah. Yeah. Walk. In the 11th episode of Legend of Korra, Skeletons in the Closet, Korra and her friends hide in an underground homeless shelter until Iroh's fleet arrives, which is promptly disabled by equalist mines and aircraft. After Korra saves Iroh from drowning, she decides to go after Amon with Mako. Infiltrating Air Temple Island, they find the captive Tarlok, who reveals that Amon is his brother Noatok and also a bloodbender. Tarlok and Noatok were driven to revenge by their father Yakon, who fled Republic City after Aang captured him. Meanwhile, Korra's friends prepare an assault on the Equalist Mountain Airbase to prevent the sinking of the relief fleet under Commander Boomy, Tenzin's brother. In the 12th episode of Legend of Korra, End Game, Bolin, Asami, and Iroh try to breach the airfield, but are captured by Hiroshi Sato's Equalists. They break out thanks to Naga, and as Asami and Bolin take down Hiroshi and his mecha tanks, Iroh pursues and destroys the Equalist bombers that took off to attack the United Forces fleet. Meanwhile, Korra and Mako confront Amon at a rally in the former Pro Bending Arena, intending to expose him as a bender. They managed to free Tenzin and his family, who Amon had intended to debend on stage. But in the bowels of the arena, Amon overpowers Mako and Korra and removes her bending. Amon bloodbends Mako and is about to take away his bending when Korra successfully airbends, sending him flying into the water. Amon flees Republic City with a desolate Tarlock, who uses an equalist lightning glove to detonate their motorboat. At the South Pole, Katara can't heal Korra's severance from water, earth, and fire. As Korra sits weeping at the cliff's edge, Aang and the other former avatars appear to her. Aang restores her connection to the other elements, explaining that her despair finally allowed her to break her spiritual block. After the love-struck Korra and Mako kiss, she enters the avatar state to restore Lin Bei Fong's bending. So we got a whole lot to talk about, obviously it's the finale. But uh, to business first. So yes, the rumors are true. We're gonna be at Comic-Con this year. But what we wanna know is if you guys would wanna organize some kind of meetup at the Comic-Con. We wanna know how many of you guys are actually going, uh, what your plans are for the con for that week. The best way for us to find out is if for you to go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Coracast, click like, and we're gonna be having a conversation this week about what our plans are and what we're gonna do. Okay. Right, now let's get into this finale. The finale. It's been an exciting adventure, it, I it, must say. It, yeah, it has. There are a lot of questions going on through uh, the whole season, and I'm surprised as to how many of them were answered in this finale. It almost feels like this was the series finale. Yeah, There's so much closure to everything. 
it feels like we might not even have to go back into this universe. Could just end it here. So, Amon is the biggest mystery going through this whole se season. Definitely the biggest thing that never made sense to us. And in the whole first part of the finale, Skeletons in the Closet, everything was revealed, basically. It, re it reminded me of the Prince's Tale in Harry Potter, kind of. We know that he's Tarlock's brother, that he has a real name. It's, um... Narwhal? Naruto? Novak. Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Nova Okay. So, um, so we know that uh, Narwhal is his real name. Uh, he was raised in the Water Tribes. He's a bloodbender. He's a waterbender. He's Yakon's son. So Yakon had plastic surgery to make his face not disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Still finding out new things about this universe. Yeah, they've the... come a long way. I mean, they did facial reconstruction on Yakon to make him look completely different. But then it's like, well, I mean, Amon didn't actually have facial scarring, but he could have gotten plastic surgery to fix it. Why not? <laughs> if you know, wanted, yeah. if he wanted to. Yeah. So, what did we think about uh, Amon's backstory? What did you guys think about it? You know, I was mostly just surprised so much that it it basically fit into everyone's predictions for him. You uh, know, a lot of our predictions and a lot of the fan predictions. Yeah. I'm so proud of you guys. Yeah, that you was guys really. Are, you guys are smart. Everyone, Avatar fans are smart. I gotta say. I'm just a little confused as to. Because right when the backstory ends is when Amon and Tarlock split. Well, no, Narwhal and Tarlock split. So, what happened in that time from when they split to when they converge again in Republic City? It seems like he's he wants to follow his own path, but he ends up doing exactly what Yukon wants, really. I mean, I guess that's right. just the tragedy of their story, in right. that both of them try to not be their father, but in a way, they end up doing exactly what he it's wants. It's the classic right. self-fulfilling prophecy of, you know, trying to prevent your fate and fulfilling it. it I, I love that. What did you think about the conclusion of their story? I am still shocked. I don't think I'm ever gonna get over that. Yeah, that was definitely the most extreme. That was the darkest, darkest thing I've ever seen in Avatar, yeah. by far. I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, <laughs> like, it was a murder suicide. Aside from Jet in the first series, which, you know, his death was very unclear, this is probably the first time that we've actually killed characters off in this universe. So let's move on. Amon was uh, totally prepared for. Right. <laughs> As we said, you know, it it, it was a trick or whatever. It was Iris a says. trap. It was a it yeah. was an elaborate ruse. The whole thing was a setup, you know, and yeah. Amon um, had it all prepared. Airplanes, yeah. It reminded Retired. me of like Pearl Harbor. It's a lot what it looked like. So a question I have: um, they put bolas in the back of their airplanes, right? But apparently, they're the first people to ever have airplanes. So those are weapons that are used to fight other airplanes. So did they pre-prepare knowing that it's possible that this crazy madman General Iroh might jump on their planes, <laughs> and steal each one one by one, <laughs> and have to come up with a backup for that? That's the only thing that makes sense. Right, there, otherwise there's no reason to have... They might as well just have a bunch of self-destruct buttons. So Amon definitely is a guy who had his stuff together the whole season. A lot like how we've been talking, he's not the typical bad guy that we've seen. He's a, he's a thinker's thinking man, you know? Like he He's more sly, he gets in there, we've talked about this before, yeah. and it took Korra and, and, and pals to realize, like, oh, we're gonna need to be smart about this. What did you guys think about, you know, the, the final confrontations in, in part two? I thought it was good, like, the only thing that I had a question about, really, is that, you know, they found out his secret and they confronted him with it, right? Right. In the arena. But ultimately, that didn't play a role in his downfall, I didn't feel. I, I don't know if I entirely agree with that. We have to take the human element into play here, and I would think that someone who's been on top and been on top of his game this entire time, for someone to show up and be like, Ben, you're a liar, he had to have been shaken at least, you know? Yeah, maybe his he his guard slipped a little bit and, and in so doing he he made mistakes that he shouldn't have. Right. I feel like his, his downfall like was a little too quick, especially since he's been built up through the entire series as just this like immortal character who cannot lose. It went from him having a rally on stage basically saying no one can stop me, the Avatar can't stop me, to him losing like five seconds later. Well, it's not so cut and dry though. I mean, they had the good guys on the ropes for most of this episode, and it wasn't just Kara and Mako. Some of them are off fighting Hiroshi, some of them are fighting the ships. There's a moment where everyone's losing. I mean, yeah. It, yeah. if not for like their animal pals coming in, you know, like <laughs> yeah. we could have lost half of Team Avatar. I did like the season finale, but if you think about the consequences of the Equalist actions, at least towards the end, Korra was able to like return everyone's bending. Right. So really, the only thing that the Equalist did, or at least Amon did, was remove everyone's bending. They got it back. So right. what were the real consequences 
Basically, what? I would just say more unrest between benders and unbenders. Because well, after, yeah. after this, now they're disenfranchised and they have no voice. They have no power. Right. I don't think that this is something that's just going to die overnight. Yeah. You know, just because they lost their their, their magic leader. Right. And I, I mean, I don't know if that's where we're going to lead into in the next season or not. But I, right. but I would say that that is the only real consequence of Amon's entire campaign. As much as the finale was was wrapped up neatly, there definitely were still more questions created in the energy bending. Right, because they never really explained, okay, what is he doing with blood bending? He's, I guess, just blocking off a chakra or something, so it makes well, him not be able to bend. Vince so eloquently put it last episode, maybe he's breaking their brains using right. <laughs> blood bending, and that's the best explanation that we got, at least from this episode. There's that huge, crazy avatarish moment at the end where Aang comes back with all, every other avatar. Yeah. Is he a ghost or does he have a physical form? Because he's not blue, ghosty Jedi looking like he, no. you know, the past avatars were in the first season. Right. Well, the entire spiritual part of the series is completely different than the original because, you know, she never enters the spirit world. Right. She, you know, she has these weird flashbacks that weren't part I've of the never original. Never seen that. And then Aang and the other avatars appear before her in a very real kind of a state. I mean, obviously they're not really there. Right. But then, you know, like you said, they're usually like a blue wispy thing. And in that state, he's able to undo the physical things that Amon right. did to change. So there's got to be some overlap as far as how those abilities work right. between what Amon's doing and what Aang is doing. There's got to be some similarities close enough to so that not only can he fix her, she can now access the Avatar state, fix other people. Yeah. You know, it, it, it did seem like a little bit too easy of a... A, a little a, bit too much, because it didn't feel like she really had to work for it. It, it was almost by, by messing up by failing, that is to say, getting captured by Amon and having her bending taken away, that she was able to, one, unlock air bending, and then later, unlock the Avatar state. Did it remind you of the interview that at the end when Aang shows up of uh, Fight Club, the it's only after you've lost everything that you're free to do anything? Yep. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the, kind of the sentiment the I thing got. Is, I would have been okay with Korra getting her powers back, but I would have thought it would have been down the road, series finale, season two. That would have made sense as to the rumors that book two will be energy or spirit, right. because mm -hmm. then, it, rather than getting having the spiritual energy fix all at once, she would then have to go it research been, this yeah. ancient art that nobody knows about mm -hmm. and go, okay, I gotta fix me, Lynn, everyone else. It, I was shocked when she, they took her bending, but then I don't, I feel like I was almost even more shocked when they just as easily fixed it. The fact that Amon wasn't able to take air bending still doesn't make sense to me because being the Avatar, she is an airbender. Right. Like, even even if she has never been able to bend air at all, Amon should have been able to take away all of her bending. Because whatever he's doing to her that removes fire, earth, and water, shouldn't that also be removing air? It's kind of smart of the creators to not give us any actual details or explanation as far as the air bending, blood bending, all these kind of things, because that way it leaves it up to us to offer our own explanation. There were a lot of things that were uh, wrapped up very quickly, but at the same time, when you get right down into it, there's still a lot of questions that we have and a, lo a lot of things that are unclear that we kind of still want some resolution. So next week, uh, make sure you stay tuned because we're gonna have another episode of Coracast where we're gonna wrap up all of season one and we're going to kind of give our predictions as to where season two might be heading, where we would like it to go, and kind of look back at some of our past predictions and your past predictions, see which ones came true, which ones didn't. It's gonna be a good uh, core cast season finale. So uh, make sure you guys come back for that. Good finale. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah. What do we do now? <laughs>